2018. I am Erin Kepke, Vice President for the Center for Global Leadership at Meridian. Welcome to this discussion on climate diplomacy. In his first major foreign policy speech, President Biden stated, America is back as it relates to our country's engagement with the global community, especially when it comes to policies and involvement around climate change issues. The president has tapped Secretary John Kerry to serve as a special presidential climate envoy, and he has invited 40 world leaders to convene at the Leaders Summit on Climate next week. Meridian has been a proud partner with the State Department over the years on many climate and environmental programs, as well as on a range of science diplomacy initiatives. This includes the State Department's Science Envoys Program, Meridian serves as a programmatic partner for the Science Envoy Program, which allows eminent US science, scientists and engineers to leverage their expertise and networks to forge important connections in the US and abroad to identify opportunities for sustained international cooperation. Selected Science Envoys are Nobel Prize winners, leaders in academia, distinguished authors and government advisors. They are selected to focus on issues of common interest in science, technology, and engineering fields and are instrumental in strengthening U.S. science and technological relationships, reaching out to foreign publics and advancing policy initiatives. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the moderator for this climate diplomacy conversation, Mr. Scott Tong. Scott is a senior correspondent of Marketplace on America Public Media. His coverage focuses on sustainability issues such as energy, climate, environment, and natural resources. He previously served as Marketplace's China Bureau Chief, and he's reported from dozens of countries around the world. Scott, thank you for being here today. It's an honor. So please take it from here. Thank you, Aaron, and good morning, everyone. Thanks to the team at Meridian and everyone involved in this event. It's a great privilege to be part of this. Um, I'm joined by three veteran diplomats who will be part of this panel, and I'm looking forward to, to hearing what all of them have to say. Um, I have just a couple minutes to introduce each of them, so I'm going to get going quickly. And um, I imagine you have their full bios in front of you, which we won't get to fully. But allow me to first introduce Ambassador Marsha Bernicat um, at the State Department. She wears two big hats in her job. She's a senior official for economic growth, energy, and the environment, and the acting assistant secretary for oceans and international environment and scientific affairs. Ambassador Bernicat is a career foreign service officer with a long and distinguished career at the State Department. She served as ambassador to Bangladesh, Senegal, Guinea-Bissau. She was in the State Department Bureau of South Asian Affairs, where she served as director. She served at top levels in Barbados, Malawi, Mor Morocco, and India. And before that, she had a stint in the private sector at Procter & Gamble in New York. She's a native of New Jersey and Ambassador Bernicat studied at Lafayette College and my alma mater, Georgetown University. So go Hoyas. Uh, Ambassador Nina Hachigian, um, representing the city of Los Angeles. And she works a job of the future. She is the Deputy Mayor of International Affairs, the first in the US to have that title. Under Mayor Eric Garcetti, uh, she is the first person to have that title. Ambassador Hachigian was previously ambassador to ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Uh, and before that, she was a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, where she focused on Asia policy and US-China relations. And before that, she was at the RAND Corporation, directing the RAND Center for Asia Pacific Policy. Ambassador Hachigian served in the Clinton White House at the National Security Council in 1998 and 99. And she has edited a book called Debating China and is co-author of The Next American Century, How the U.S. Can Thrive as, as Other Powers Rise. She studied at Yale and Stanford. Welcome, Ambassador Hachigian. And Ambassador Aslak Brun uh, from Norway's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Good morning to you, sir. Uh, Ambassador Brun is the Deputy Director General in the Department of Sustainable Development in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He is previously ambassador to the UN organizations in Rome, and he has had a long career 
in development and climate change. He worked at top levels in the Ministry of International Development, the Department of Economic Relations and Development, and the Section on Climate Change. On this topic, he was a chief climate negotiator leading up to the Paris Agreement um, from 2013 to 2016. Ambassador Brun has served at embassies in India, in the Netherlands, in Sierra Leone. He's a political scientist by training. So thanks to all of you for this. We're gonna talk about climate and diplomacy, but I'd like to ask all, each of you to personalize this issue. You have been in far, far flung parts of the world that a lot of us will never go to. And I wanna ask you, and maybe I'll ask Ambassador, Ambassador Bernicat to start, if you can give us just a snapshot of something you've seen that really puts a human picture and a human face on the climate change impact and the climate change promise going forward. Can I ask you, Ambassador Bernie Kat, to start? Scott, thank you so much. Um, and thank you to Meridian House for hosting this event. I um, have to mention my experience in Bangladesh, the um, eighth largest country in the world, the most densely populated country in the world, and they are losing approximately 1% of their land mass a year, not just from rising sea levels, as you'd imagine, but also because um, all of the major uh, river systems in South Asia drain into the Bay of Bengal through Bangladesh. So as there's um, more melt and, and, and more rain, um, you, I've literally seen pieces of villages melting away on television. Um, I wasn't physically present, but um, the water just carries away um, land. What part of Bangladesh doesn't flood every year, which is roughly two thirds of the country as the rivers swell during rainy seasons, um, uh, experience a drought. So Bangladeshis are literally at ground zero for, for climate change. They currently head the Climate Vulnerable Forum, 48 countries that only represent 5% of the world's emissions, but 1.2 billion people. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, Ambassador Brun. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Good to join you from, from Oslo. Um, if I am to take a personal, um, something that has made a strong impression on me, I need to take it to the very top of Norway. So on top of Norway, halfway between Norway and the North Pole, you find a Norwegian archipelago called Svalbard. And there you can really see climate change happening with your own eyes because climate change there is so much faster than the rest of the world. Uh, the world. Uh, it's actually six times faster the temperature increase than, than what you see uh, uh, on the global average. So if you have the opportunity like I had to come back to the same place 10 or 15 years later, mm -hmm. the landscape, the seascape is totally different. Where, it was, where you saw a uh, uh, an old year glacier, you would now see open waters, you would see actually a rock where it just used to be uh, a glacier. And, and what made the most impression on, on me was when I was on a ship traveling to a research station up north in, in that archipelago. And I saw the skipper driving, uh, you know, navigating by some uh, sea maps that looked totally uh, out, out of date because he was actually traveling through solid land, it appeared. And of course, of course, I, I just couldn't understand it. You know, how, how can this be? I mean, uh, is it very old or very inaccurate? And of course you have all guessed it by now, but I didn't understand it just sitting there watching. But of course it was only a few years old, those maps, but the all the glaciers had receded. And now you, we travel through what, appear to be open waters, but we used to think it was solid land below. So it's happening very quickly and you can actually see it if you, if you have a chance to travel there and coming back. Yeah, well, thank you. Good reminder of climate change we're seeing now and you know how our, how our world, how the places we go to, how our assumptions just so quickly become obsolete uh, in this fast changing situation. Ambassador Hachigian, do you have a thought, an anecdote? Um, I'll say two. One is that, you know, of course, I served in Southeast Asia, and there's so many countries there that are climate vulnerable, especially to increasingly strong typhoons, which, you know, just literally wipe out villages uh, on a regular basis. Um, 
Uh, but also here in California, we've had, uh, you know, as many know, just the most devastating fires ever on record. Um, and we keep breaking records, you know, every year for the hottest day, uh, and, you know, and in Los Angeles was last year ever. Um, and, uh, you know, and our firefighters uh, are, uh, <laughs> you know, are, are having to really rethink how they do their jobs um, because, uh, because it's just much worse than it's ever been uh, in terms of the fire threat. Yeah, and, and I understand some of the projections show that the <clears throat> super hot days in vulnerable parts of Los Angeles may double or triple unless things change significantly. That's yeah. Absolutely right. Yeah, okay, okay, great. Um, Ambassador Bernicat, um, can I start by asking you about, uh, actually, let me uh, uh, take time out. What I needed to do is to tell those of you who are joining us here that we're going to talk for maybe another 25 minutes or so and I'll engage in a conversation with the, uh, with the panelists here, which will leave a good 15 or 20 minutes for you to provide your questions, um, which we will get to before long. Um, I think the good people at the team at Meridian will find a way to deliver the questions to me through the, the diplomatic pouch known as Google Docs, I think. I'll find, <laughs> figure out how to get those. Um, but get your questions ready, please. And we will try to get to as many of those as we can. Okay, back to Ambassador Bernicat. Um, um, John Kerry has said that the State Department is getting back on track on the issue of climate change. So can I ask you, um, what was the situation in the previous track before this? And what really does right track mean in, in measurable ways? Well, I really want to emphasize that even prior to the beginning of the Biden-Harris administration, the United States was exerting a great deal of leadership on the climate issue. Um, we were involved in every forum. Um, and Aaron, thank you so much for, for mentioning science and particularly the work that State Department does in deploying scientists around the world. But uh, so much of what we know about global warming, especially in the Arctic, comes from U.S. science. So we continue to be present. We continue to um, uh, express our concerns even before uh, January 20th. Um, but on John January 20th, President Biden really began getting us back on track literally um, within an hour or so of his being inaugurated um, by uh, uh, indicating that we would rejoin the, the Paris Agreement. Um, he also named uh, Secretary Kerry as his special envoy for climate. Um, who is leading a concerted march, if you will, uh, towards uh, COP26 in Glasgow um, to get countries to um, honor, but really to increase their nationally determined contributions um, so that we are driving ourselves purposefully to a limit uh, of warming to 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius. And I would add that um, this administration has put a real emphasis on a whole of government approach. So it's not just the work of the State Department and EPA, uh, if you will, and the Department of Energy, but even every office in the Department of State is being asked um, not to contribute to climate goals and to build climate into all of the things that we do. So it's truly a whole of government approach. Mm -hmm. um, as, as has been mentioned, President Biden next week is going to host a leader summit on climate. It has been reported that uh, the U.S. may announce a significant goal of reducing U.S. emissions, perhaps in the range of 50 percent by 2030, as has been reported. Can you tell us a little bit of what we can expect and what message does the U.S. have to send to be credible to the world on this issue? Right. Well, I think the first message, Scott, and again, you know, in the back on track, uh, uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me, mode, is that we recognize this is a problem the world has to tackle together. No country is exempt, um, although uh, the, uh, the summit will gather the, or reconvene the major economies forum on energy and climate, which will bring together the 16 countries plus the EU who are responsible for 80% of global emissions. So um, one, by reconvening that group, we're, we're sending a very strong message of our seriousness in in accelerating our efforts um, worldwide. 
Secondly, you're right, we're gonna have to have a very um, significant increase. The MDCs are voluntary. So the, the idea is to, uh, is to not have to, you know, how do I wanna put this? We don't have to get legislative approval. What we have to do is come up with good, credible goals that make sense to our economies, that make sense to our energy security, but also makes sense to our, to our environment. I'm not going to scoop the president uh, on what that NDC is going to look like, but- um, You have an meant... opportunity. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough, but guaranteed it will be meant to spur uh, others to do the same. And as you know, Secretary Kerry has been on the road for the yeah. last couple of weeks, mm -hmm. specifically working with some of the key uh, countries on that goal. And, and just briefly before I, I move, can you tell us what Secretary Kerry's main message has been on the road? Yeah, I think, you know, the main message has been, we all need to do more. Uh, the uh, task is more urgent than ever, uh, that um, the Paris mechanism is, is the right one. Um, he's also talking a lot about the fact that this isn't simply about setting goals. Um, the estimates for what it will take to build the infrastructure and to make the changes to support the transformations, especially in energy, are going to be huge. So we are also committing ourselves to helping literally move financial markets to support the cost, right? Governments can't do it alone. This will not be a matter of foreign assistance, though, again, what foreign assistance hasn't been focused on energy and environment will absolutely contain greater elements of that. Um, we also need to spur innovation. We know that the Clean Air Act in 1970 created a huge incentive to invent better ways of using and cleaner ways of using, using energy. We really have to supercharge that innovation um, spark around the world. And then finally, again, he's been trying to really double down on the message of everyone increasing their ambition. If we don't set mm -hmm. good, aggressive, achievable goals, we aren't, uh, it's too easy to have those goals overtaken by other priorities. Great, thanks. And I should say on innovation to, re to remind the folks here, I'm sure many have seen the recent study by the folks at Berkeley who on innovation have said that um, in, the, in the US as far as achieving um, uh, perhaps 90% reductions in emissions in the electricity system. You know, as someone said on TV years ago, we have the technology. Um, solar and wind and battery technology for a long time, I feel like having covered this on and off for a number of years, there's been kind of a waiting for the technology curve to get to a certain place. And it seems like in certain areas, we're there or, or, or some of the key technologies are there, um, which, which makes this a critical moment, of course. Um, Ambassador Bruton, can I ask you um, about um, Norway's priorities approaching the COP26 in Glasgow? Norway has been a global leader on key elements of climate change. Tell us about, I guess, first of all, the, the first, the key priorities that Norway will, will deliver and what influence as, as a leader, as a key country that is working to make the transition away from fossil energy, what influence can Norway exert? Well, let me start by, by echoing my pre the previous speaker, you know, we all need to do more. And I think that message is the key one. And, and uh, I, I need to start by, uh, by saying how happy the Norwegian government is to see uh, the US re-engaging in multilateral matters, uh, especially uh, rejoining the, the Paris Agreement. I, 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 uh, let, me, let me tell you why this is so important. I, I was in Paris and, and we made a good framework and we actually bended the curve, not long shooting for four degrees heating, but between two and three degrees. So that was a start, but we knew it was not enough. So how do we actually increase ambition over time? That was part of what the Paris Agreement delivered on. And the idea was that every five years, the world community comes together and have a global stock take. Are we on the right track? And obviously we're not. And then every five years, all of us, every each one of us will have to go back and look at our national determined target. And 
and say, how can we go do more? So we have to revisit and we cannot go back. We need to increase the ambition of the, of the present uh, uh, ambition level. So if you can say a, a, an agreement is beautiful, you know, this is the beauty of the Paris Agreement. There is an inbuilt ambition mechanism, making sure that it's stronger and stronger every five years. And to be, to, to be frank, obviously this it didn't really work with the, the, the largest economy not around the table. So, you know, so you know, with America taking the lead on this, putting 1.5 degrees squarely on the table, this is so important. And, and this is also Norway's top priority to, to, to make sure that we can all help deliver on this goal. Okay. Um, um, great. And, and for those of us who have not um, focused too much, can you talk about Norway's specific um, targets and domestically, as far as domestic policy, what, what's important for us to know about? Yeah. Yeah. So we, we just introduced a new national uh, uh, climate action plan. Uh, and this is the way we translate our 2030 commitment under the Paris Agreement into policies. So uh, um, we all already increased it last year. So we aim to cut 50 to 55% of all emissions by 2030. And, and of course, there's a set of policies uh, to get us on that pathway. But the main vehicle is putting a price on carbon so that we already have a, a high price on carbon, making me as, as a consumer, making it easy for me to, to buy, for instance, a, a, an electric car as compared to, to a traditional car, because uh, fuel-free cars are, are cheaper. Um, so we want to use that mechanism. Um, and the main instrument is to actually increase this levy on CO2 emissions threefold, progressively mm -hmm. towards 2030, so that this will influence all sectors of the economy and, and we can have the same sort of ship, shifts in, you know, in green shipping, in carbon capture and storage, in, 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 uh, uh, in ocean wind, in, in so many sectors that are, are important. We are a small economy, so I mean, our contribution as a nation doesn't really count that much in the global picture. But what we hope to do is that helping spur these innovations, helping technological change, we can show examples that can be showcased, scaled up, replicated elsewhere, so that so mm -hmm. that that a technological change will speed up. Yeah, yeah, and and kind of echoing Ambassador Bernicat, it sounds like these are policies leveraging the private sector, right, to, to innovate on these things and to put costs on technologies. Uh, we want to speed up as far as phasing out and to, uh, and to encourage certain industries. I, I do want to ask you briefly, um, as, the, as the one kind of non-American on our panel, I want to ask you about U.S. credibility um, here. You know, uh, there is talk, of course, of the U.S. getting back on track, as this administration puts it. What does the, the Biden administration have to show in terms of leadership to to restore credibility. Give us a little bit of a picture of the view from where you sit. First, I have to say that we have always worked very closely with the US, uh, uh, also in, 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 uh, in the other administration. And we, we happen to be in the same sort of nego negotiation group when we do uh, climate negotiations. So we, we, we understand the, the American interest very well. I think there's no way we can overestimate the importance of the U.S. coming back to this table. It's absolutely not possible to overestimate it. And, and the reason why is what I just said, you know, that if uh, one of the major economies, number one economy, number two polluted in the world, say we all had to get the target towards 1.5, that is what is needed to get the other major economies follow. To, to put pressure on, on all of us, small and big, to, to, do, to put our best foot forward, to really do what we can do. If there is no such leadership, of course, this, uh, this, this idea that we voluntarily will just sit uh, in our, uh, each or in our individual capitals and find out we need to do more, it's not happening that way. We need a, a global yeah. leader, and uh, the US is that global leader. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, Ambassador Hachikian, let me ask you about uh, the role of cities as global leaders. Um, uh, done well, I guess, what can cities around the world do to 
contribute to this in, I guess, in real measurable ways? Sure. Um, well, we've been, I mean, US cities, let me just say, have been uh, pretty aggressive at tackling this problem. Um, and, you know, when President Trump took us out of the uh, Paris Climate Accord, um, uh, Mayor Garcetti founded something called Climate Mayors, and which now is about 500 mayors who've all agreed to, um, to stay in. Uh, and, you know, I'm a card carrying member of the Marsha Bernacat fan club. I, <laughs> she's <laughs> a great friend, but um, it did not appear, and I don't dispute at all that a lot was going on behind the scenes, but I do think it appeared from the outside that America was not leading on climate um, uh, at a national level. And, at, but at a local level, we really were. And um, it comes down to, you know, at the end of the day, the nuts and bolts of what you have to do to actually, you know, change the energy mix uh, in places. Uh, and so in LA, for example, Mayor Garcetti uh, in 2019 launched uh, LA's Green New Deal mm -hmm. and it laid out five zeros, zero carbon grid, zero carbon transportation, zero waste, zero wasted water, zero carbon buildings. We have the uh, largest municipally owned utility in the US and we just completed a three year groundbreaking study with a national lab that ran millions of scenarios and worked with the community to show that there were viable paths <laughs> get to a net zero grid uh, in 25 years or even 2035. Um, and our grid is already about 40% uh, renewables because of gigantic solar and wind uh, projects that we have. Um, and these are creating thousands and thousands of new jobs. Um, we're making investments in electric vehicles, in our city fleets, in buses, charging stations um, we're building. And all of this is happening pretty much ahead of schedule. Um, and we're working with our international partners. So uh, the mayor chairs a group called C40, which is the about a hundred mega cities, all um, pledging to reduce their carbon or their fair share by half by 2030 and net zero by uh, 2050. And uh, it's, it's, it's his ambition to bring a thousand cities to COP who have made that pledge. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I will predict that we'll be able to, to hit that mark. And when you look at, um, you know, city, the, just the 100 cities, it's something like 25% of, of GDP. So it really makes a difference. And cities are often the ones that have these levers that actually uh, they can turn to make the, uh, to make energy greener. It's, there is no substitute for a, a federal partner though. Uh, and it's much, much easier uh, to do this work when we have uh, the federal government, um, you know, leading. Um, and let me ask you about the, the idea of, of cities having unique levers that they can turn. Do you have a, a for instance, of uh, something that a city can do, either Los Angeles or another city, that a federal government might not be able to do? Well, it's all, you know, as I said, it's always great if you're pairing with the federal government, either through funding or through, you know, uh, innovation or whatever. But um, there are many such levers. So building codes. Right, we we run the building codes uh, and write the building codes of Los Angeles. So if you, you know, depending on how we decide to write that code, you have to be a more green or less green, you know, standard. Same thing with our fleets, our electric buses, you know, that run all over the city to take people where they're going. We're building out 15 new uh, rail lines, which is I think one of the largest. It's 120 billion dollars over the next uh, generation, basically, to build out public transportation in Los Angeles. I think it's the biggest project of its kind in the country. Um, you know, we're greening our port. We're, we're testing uh, zero emissions uh, port vehicles. Um, we have a we have a um, a, uh, a bus cons electric bus consortium. So we've gathered a bunch of other municipalities so that all together we have more market weight and can send the market signal mm -hmm. to bus companies that we want uh, electric buses. Um, we have we're talking to green hydrogen companies um, all the time, and that's probably going to end up being part of our mix too. And like I said, we own this utility, so this you know that power that we deliver to the citizens of Los Angeles is is a matter of what the city decides to do. Um, in, for example, building the largest solar battery uh, power plant you know in the United States right now. Um, so there's there's many levers that we that we have. Um, to, you know, that we can, so that we can, you know, help. But like I said, it's great to have a federal partner. Yeah, and I, I guess I do have to ask you, um, you know, given um, 
at least from far away, the, the reputation deserved or not that Los Angeles has. Do you have to deal with a lot of um, image issues when people say, you know, who have been on the freeway, who have been on the 405 say Los Angeles? Really? I mean, what do you have to contend with when you talk about the things that you've just mentioned? I don't need to, to repeat them, but but yeah. what is the starting point that is, a, I imagine, a challenge for you? It's funny. I mean, within climate circles, I think LA is pretty well known to be, you know, the most aggressive uh, city probably mm -hmm. in the country or, or one of them, certainly. And the mayor has shown a lot of leadership in, you know, in these various climate organizations that he runs or has started. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. I think it's probably uh, for someone who hasn't been here for 10 years or 20 years or has never been here. Um, it, you know, it's it's a challenge. But you know, we just tell them the facts, and then they, uh, you know, they're they're fairly surprised. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Let me turn and I want to ask each of you uh, uh, a question about. I guess your, your role, the, the job of the diplomat on this particular issue, and maybe staying with you, Ambassador Hachigian, to, to start your a former ambassador to, to ASEAN. How can um, foreign service officers kind of incorporate climate or elevate the climate issue into their goals, into their, into their daily work, right? We, all of us who work in places you know, have different metrics, right, to measure what's important to you. As far as foreign service officers, the State Department, um, how can climate be elevated to a central priority? Because there are so many priorities. Right. Um, well, I mean, you can start by making it, you know, a one of the goals of every relationship that we have. You know, we always um, are kind of renewing and refreshing our, our ideas about, you know, what our bilateral relationship with a certain country is going to entail. And I think climate should uh, always be on that list now. Um, you know, something that, uh, that I didn't see happen very much when I was in the Foreign Service, but also I was in a multilateral post, so it might be different. But I would like our diplomats to be looking for solutions in other places that we can use in the U.S. Mm. Um, I do think that... <clears throat> Innovation is important, but there's a lot of good technology and good systems already out there that we just, you know, that haven't been widely shared. So I would say that's another, um, another piece, uh, you know, and also just to seek out in the country where they are the real causes of inaction or uh, destructive action. What are the what are the politics? What are the log jams? I mean, I remember in Jakarta, and I, I wasn't the bilateral ambassador, so I wasn't deep in this, but the air quality there is just terrible. Mm -hmm. um, they have not good fuel standards, uh, you know, very low fuel standards. And it turned out that it was really this one refining plant, which didn't have a part, uh, which couldn't be fixed. And, uh, and therefore, the, you know, the, the air quality mm -hmm. was terrible everywhere. So, but, but it's our diplomats who can learn those problems and then help you know, take them to the United States and the international community to help them get fixed. Yeah, and, and are there incentives, um, measurable incentives for diplomats to, to do that, right? To take these great ideas from somewhere else and kind of bring them back. I don't know if that's there should just be. an informal, sh uh, there should be, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, Ambassador Bruden, um, I, I wanna ask you, I mean, you were central in the Paris climate talks and, and you were in the room uh, as it were in these critical talks and I wanna, Ask you to help us understand the role of diplomatic skills here. What did you see as far as mo perhaps important moments where the skills of, of diplomacy really worked when something succeeded? And perhaps if you have an anecdote of when um, perhaps diploma diplomacy um, didn't succeed and, and, and why, from the perspective of individual diplomats and their skills, why did it not? Oh, gosh. I, I, I just have to weigh in very quickly on your question about incentives. Um, by and large, we are type A's, uh, folks who, who join the Department of State. And we <laughs> join to save the world. We join to make a difference. And it is amazing. I won't tell, do the whole anecdote, but if you know the story of Embassy Beijing, putting an air quality monitor on its roof mm -hmm. and then publicizing mm -hmm. the results. Yep. It literally um, uh, caused China to address its air pollution problems. 
So um, seeing those kinds of results are, are a major incentive uh, for, yeah. for us. Um, yeah. But to your question about diplomacy, um, you know, for one, uh, having the administration at your back. So the fact that the, the president has made um, climate policy at the, or put it at the center of US foreign policy and national security is a, is, is a huge, um, is a huge gain for diplomats. And those who will be going to COP26 will have that advantage. But I would say um, uh, in general, um, when you walk into the room, you already have a great deal of background. Um, if you've done your homework, which we do, we understand each country's position. Um, we know each negotiator, oftentimes, mm -hmm. you know, through years of, of working together um, and have a good sense of, uh, if you don't have a good sense of what it is the people around the table need to bring away, um, it, it's much harder to achieve your own goals. So the idea is to develop a position that you can bring others to. Sometimes mm -hmm. it means asking a third country or a, a second country to carry an, uh, a, a suggestion forward. Um, it might be more palatable. It might, um, you know, uh, uh, it might uh, help break a log jam. Whereas if the United States were to raise the issue, it wouldn't get the same amount of traction. Mm -hmm. um, try to imagine that um, most uh, environment related conferences are not a single forum. Um, there could be anywhere up to a dozen different negotiations going on simultaneously. So having good communication so that you understand what position China's taking in one room compared to another um, will also feed into the, to the uh, negotiations. Um, in the end, it does come down to the skill of the individual not only knowledge, but personality, knowing when to fold, knowing mm. when to make a very strong argument. Um, you asked for an example of a, of a failure. Um, when we were at the, um, uh, the uh, UN Environment Conference in Kenya in uh, January. Forgive me, Ambassador, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause you briefly. Off. We need to, 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 to thank Ambassador Hachigian, uh -huh. who we know has to, has to head off to, uh, to to another call and meeting. So thanks for joining us. Much appreciated. I'm so sorry yes. I have to go, but okay. it's climate related, so. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it, it, it must be, right. So thank you. Uh, Ambassador Burdekett, sorry, uh, uh, let me allow you to kind of finish and then I can move on to Ambassador Brun. Go ahead. Please. Sure, but just very, very briefly, um, our negotiators argue very strongly regarding the type of reference that was made to um, uh, to marine debris. Um, uh, the previous administration felt very strongly that it should not be defined as plastics and plastics alone. Um, but most of the rest of the world wanted the word plastics into this. It just gives you the sense of how granular yeah. these, mm -hmm. uh, these mm -hmm. negotiations can get. In, uh, in, in a plenary set, excuse me, in a, in a, in a sub-plenary session, we were able to win the day and not have plastic included in the in the negotiation, but it brought down the final communique in that um, the same uh, uh, group, and I, I won't name names, who insisted on having the word plastics inserted, managed mm -hmm. to get it inserted into the final communique, and we had to list our objections as a result. Um, fairly minor, but uh, mm -hmm. but it can mm -hmm. get you can win the battle and lose the war, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Understand. Uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador Brun. Uh, do you have your own uh, war stories from being inside the room, uh, for, for particularly in Paris. Well, I'm, I'm afraid what uh, the example just mentioned from uh, from the uh, UNEP circles was was an, an area where we actually won a battle, a battle against the U.S. Actually, but you know, in 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 Paris, we had this beautiful instrument called night negotiations. So you would. Could, I'm you could sorry. Eat, can you say again? Uh, night what negotiations. So we would we would negotiate throughout the whole night for several nights uh, consecut consecutively, and you know this means that instead of having a full room where those who want a, a, an ambitious agreement seems to be in a somewhat in a minority, you would have a smaller room where only the most eager people will sit around the table. And there, you know, the, the dynamics would change because 
of course you would have uh, the showstoppers there as well and they would be forceful and they would be strong but they would they would seem to be in a minority so already you have an advantage and then you can go on and on and 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 sometimes you know some of, of these uh, showstoppers will 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 uh, think this is not worth it so so uh, just to show you uh, one concrete example, we, we as Norway, together with another, another country, we tabled the proposal of the 1.5 uh, target in the agreement. Mm -hmm. and it did not fly uh, in the first place, uh, but we managed to sort of isolate, you know, just a handful of countries that objected in the second night session. And then with, with, uh, with, with the help of some, some uh, Good friends with with uh, uh, calling to capitals, you know, there were fewer the last uh, last night, and then then we said we have almost consensus, so we tabled it, and we went to the friends and said you can table this. We think this will fly, but but if we had to do this with everybody in the room, you know, in in regular hours, we could never reach it. So so you need to to be creative. You need to find avenues where you can actually build on 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 on. Uh, on, on uh, those who want to have the, those who want the most, those are the ones who will sit through the night and those are the ones mm -hmm. that will actually help you deliver. Yeah, yeah, well, interesting, right? I, you're talking about developing momentum, it sounds like, right? With the right people in the small room first and then mm -hmm. to, to present it and, and create uh, a pressure, right? Diplomatic pressure, as it were, yeah. Um, okay, uh, we're gonna move on to your questions and uh, and please uh, send them over. Thanks to uh, the team for delivering them. I've got, I'm re reading them off my phone here. So um, uh, let me ask a question about the Biden administration. So perhaps this first to Ambassador Bernicat. The Biden administration talks about cooperating with China where we can, competing where we must. How does the climate change category fall into that broadly? And what might incentivize China to work with the US government on climate? So I, I'd love both of you to, uh, to, to weigh in on that. But first, Ambassador Bernicat, please. Yeah, thank you. You know, um, there is every incentive and opportunity to work with China on climate. Um, China represents almost 30% of global emissions and that doesn't count the carbon intensive investments that they make abroad. So um, while President Xi has committed to carbon neutrality before 2060, the PRC is not yet on a path that would allow that to happen, much less to get us to the 1.5 degrees Celsius goal. So um, we know um, without China significantly changing what it's doing now, we won't get to the to, um, to this goal. So, um, um, you know, um, Special Presidential Envoy Kerry um, has been in touch with his counterpart, Minister Xi Jinping, um, since they both been appointed, and they are they have been engaged in in their initial conversations um, uh, to try and and uh, and set the groundwork for China increasing its national. Uh, ambition. Of course, the U.S. and China's, I mean, the relationship is at uh, a significantly low point, as, as all would acknowledge now. Um, I guess as a question is asked, are there certain specific incentives that the U.S. or other countries can, can put on the table to try to encourage, as you described, Beijing to do more? Yeah. Well, I, I think it's fair to say that the biggest incentive has to be that, you know, China aspires, you know, um, to, to be seen as a world leader. And I don't believe that can possibly be the case by most of the countries of the world if it is not, if it doesn't transition to becoming part of the solution to the climate problem. So I think that's the biggest incentive. Yeah. Our okay. economies are tied very closely together. Obviously, and I think uh, not just the U.S. and China, but U.S. and 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 uh, and much of the world. And I think you know, in terms of uh, the transitions that need to take place, um, there's huge incentive in how to encourage um, how to encourage the kinds of innovation 
um, as well as transitions that need to take place. Again, not only in what China is doing domestically, but also what it does internationally. Um, the US uh, and, uh, and the EU, I know the G7 are involved at the moment, looking at ways in which we build into every development project, not only a climate focus, but also a set of agreed upon values or standards that infrastructure and other projects will take into account. So environmental impact has been a part of development pro projects for years, but now add on top of that, you know, you know, is it, should we be favoring? And the answer is yes. Energy efficient projects, should we, you know, energy transition projects. And, and uh, with that, create the kind of pressure that helps policymakers in all countries um, make the right choices for the climate. Right, and, and right now, is that policy of the US government or the State Department to have those climate measurables in these projects? Absolutely, absolutely. And we're yeah. finding, okay. I, I was participating in a, a meeting um, at the UN on, on infrastructure finance. Every government official, every multilateral bank representative mentioned the environmental uh, uh, metrics that they're using. It's very okay. encouraging. Uh, Ambassador Brun, you know the Chinese delegation, you have uh, uh, spoken with them. What are your observations on, on the role of the U.S.-China relationship on climate and, and more broadly, um, uh, China's role uh, as being a leader or potential leader on the climate issue? I think China is, is different from many of us because, uh, as mentioned, China contributes alone over a quarter of all emissions, 30% or so. So it means, you know, for them, it's not only something they, they, it's not a global situation they contribute to the rest of the world, it's happening in their own country. So it means, I, I talked to some um, uh, NGO uh, representatives in China one time and asked, what is driving climate ambition in your country? I said, in my country, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, pressure groups, it's, uh, it's um, businesses. In, in China, he said, it's the Communist Party because they are afraid of, 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 of their own population being fed up with pollution, with not being able to, to, to look out the window, the kids getting asthma and getting sick. So because they're so big, because they contribute so much, they can actually also be part of the solution. So that, mm -hmm. in that sense, they're, they're different. But of course, they also need to not lead by themselves. They need to, to because they uh, industrialize later than the rest of us. They're not the major contributor globally over, over many years. So they need to, to, to see that what they are doing is, is a combined effort with, with all G20 countries, with, with uh, the US, with uh, India, with Brazil, with, with a lot of countries. And, and again, we need a convener. I think uh, uh, the US has the potential to be that convener that can actually help spur the highest possible ambition also in China. Yeah, okay. And, and I guess I, I, I just want to ask you one more question on this. I mean, the world, in economic terms, of course, the world has changed and, and China has arrived, as, as we all know. Does that, given its economic influence around the world, does that change the, the dynamic of diplomacy and negotiations uh, in the room, as it were, say, when the COP in, in Glasgow convenes? Yes, I would say definitely. I, it's, uh, um, China has... has uh, uh, they have their own um, diplomatic uh, 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 efforts. They, they, they talk to a lot of countries. They have um, uh, considerable uh, aid uh, to, to many countries. Uh, so so uh, they are listened to. Uh, uh, and and uh, uh, they can actually drum up big numbers if there's something they disagree with and they are unhappy with. And they can also persuade uh, other countries that join in if they, they seem this is a reasonable balance agreement. So they're de definitely a, a more and more active global player in this. Yep, thank you. Um, uh, we have a question on 
young people and climate issues. The question is, Secretary mm -hmm. General Gutierrez has consistently mentioned his priority to engage young people in the global effort. Um, where do you see young people fitting into climate diplomacy efforts and how can they join these critical conversations? Uh, either of you, who would like to jump in first? Oops, I would very much, Scott. Um, I, I would say, you know, the, the time for action is now and, and everyone at the community level, in your schools, uh, even broader. I mean, look at Greta Thunberg, if you want to see an example of, of, um, of uh, real, real activism getting real results. Um, the other thing I think is uh, we emphasize a lot, both overseas and back here in the US, STEM education. You know, studying the sciences and technology, environment and medicine are all gonna be key. We need more people with technical skills um, to come up with those innovations that, that we were talking about. Um, State with NASA has a program called GLOBE where um, communities, schools can apply to uh, work as citizen scientists and they gather information that is then fed back into the scientific community. Um, we've just ended a, a really great program on Zika where um, school children around the world have been you know, uh, monitoring where, uh, where mosquito nesting areas are. Um, so there are lots of ways in which young people can, can, can plug in and, and not only provide ideas, but actually take action right now. And, and of course, in the United States, uh, the, the issue of climate is in some quarters uh, an issue of debate um, and, uh, and, and can be a polarizing one. And I wonder if you have thoughts on the, the role of the younger generation, the emerging generation in the US um, as to their, their weight, their contribution to this fundamental question of climate and the science. Do you have thoughts on that? Well, I, I would just say if, if we are to believe polling results from last November, young people, thank goodness, came out in record numbers to vote. And we know that one of the issues that really motivated them to come out was climate change. Um, they wanted to say uh, they're more invested in it than all of us. And so I think, mm. you know, again, um, uh, having discovered the power of the ballot box, we're going to see more and more uh, activism on the part of young people. The other, if you go sort of in the next generation up, boardrooms are paying a lot more attention to climate issues because their younger investors insist that they do. Same mm -hmm. with labor rights. Uh, issues that were not important to the, the baby boomer investors are very important uh -huh. to millennials. And so again, I think we're, we'll see a more pragmatic approach by many companies in no small part because their stockholders want them to have a more active, proactive role in climate issues. Thanks. Ambassador Brun, your thoughts on the, the younger generation, what, what of course they have at stake and uh, what, what influence they have on the conversation now. When I was the chief climate negotiator, I actually had a, a young person always in my official delegation. Uh, because if we found those uh, insights were useful and their networks were useful. And, and I remember she made a speech that made a lasting impression on, on most that heard it. Because, you know, the climate accord from Paris, it took us over 20 years to negotiate. So she said, you have been negotiating all my life. You need to act now. You know, so that was a great phrase. Yeah, yeah, that's and I think, really... you know, generally, young people, they sense the urgency uh, generally much better than uh, older people. They are uh, asking for bolder action. But I think the most important part is that they are game changers. They adapt to new technologies, new ways of living that are more climate friendly, quicker than, than the rest of us. So they are, they are, they are very active um, and a very essential part of, of, of the society we need to see for the future. Yeah, yeah, very good. And that's a that's a good way to to, to end this. I think um, uh, I've been asked to just share a couple observations because at the top of the hour we do need to, to to say goodbye. But I think leaving it with the quote from the person you mentioned that you have been negotiating all my life. Uh, I have three teenagers in my house, and that's true. I mean, this has been uh, something where there has been a lot of talk and awaiting sufficient action. 
here. Um, and in the category of action, as we look forward, we look forward to the leader summit and uh, what the Biden administration can provide and deliver. Um, I'm sure the world is waiting for um, what might constitute credibility as we uh, turn the page on a new administration here. We of course are in, in the category of change. I've talked about the role of technology and innovation and the private sector that have to go hand in hand with public policy going forward. Um, and we've talked about just the, the, the non-state actors as well, the role of cities and states that have unique levers, right? That federal national level policymakers uh, don't, uh, don't have and the, the importance of that. And finally, we've talked about the importance of China. Uh, China as, um, as a world leader, China having uh, an economic influence it hasn't had before and that economic influence translating into diplomatic influence in, uh, in, in climate issues as we uh, lead up to the COP in, in Glasgow later this year. So let me thank uh, the team at Meridian for their good work here. Thank you, Ambassador Brune, uh, for joining us. Thank you, Ambassador Bernicat uh, as well. And uh, thanks to Ambassador Hachigian who had to leave us early. Um, have a great day, everyone. Thanks to everyone.